Hello and welcome. I am Flavia from Dog Patch Labs, and tonight we're hosting another Dublin Data Science Meetup. So just before passing on to Mick, I'm just gonna quickly explain the crowd, Crowdcast software. So here, down here, you can ask a question through the Ask a Question button. You can answer some polls, and you can use the chat function to, in, um, to chat to other attendees or also the speaker. So without further ado, I'm just going to pass it on to Mick Cooney. Thanks, Flavia. Hi, all. All right, so yeah. you're all very welcome to the... Uh, hold on, let me just get my screen there like that. Um, you're all very welcome to the March edition of Dublin Data Science. For once, we actually have a talk, which is great. So I'd like to you know, extend thanks to Dogpatch for hosting us once again. Uh, I've managed to emotionally blackmail Owen Hurl. He's, uh, he's a member from way back in the meetup primordial soup of like 2013 and 14 um and uh he's like an old friend of us ours so uh basically i managed to strong harm in into giving his talk which i'm really looking forward to because um usually our talks kind of come from people i know or talks i've been to and i've like hey could you give a version of that to us so i usually have a bit of an idea what to talk about is tonight i have a notion so i'm really looking forward to kind of being like everyone else where there's hopefully lots of surprises um, as Flavia mentioned, um, just like in, in, obviously we try to adapt for the technology. So, you know, getting talking and stuff is a bit awkward. So what's going to happen is I'm going to go on mute, but basically I'll be able to unmute myself during the talk for those of you who haven't been at any of these ones before. So if you have any questions, pop them into either the chat or the ask a question feature there. And I'm going to keep an eye on that for Owen and I'll jump in and ask any questions if just if he doesn't notice them. And that way we'll try and get a bit of discussion uh, going. So by all means, um, don't be afraid to ask questions like either in the chat or the ask a question. I'll try and go through all of them. And um, yeah, and then we can we can um, we'll address kind of them either as they're relevant at the time or if there's like more kind of generic ones. Um, we'll we'll kind of address them at the end. Um, yeah, we, uh, we'll, we'll, I won't actually keep you any longer. We'll, we'll get started. There's a couple, I'll have a couple of announcements about like the next couple of months um, after the talk. But for now, I am delighted to uh, introduce Owen Hurl. He's a senior data science at Swerve. Um, and uh, yeah, he's going to talk about recommendations with TensorFlow and TensorFlow probability, I think. Is that right, Owen? Um, TensorFlow recommender systems is the library. That, okay. Uh, yeah, ah, that okay. Works Excellent. So that at this point, I'm going to shut up. And uh, yeah, I'll hand it over to Owen. Thanks, Mick. Um, okay, this is a bit strange for me. So if anyone has any questions at any time, do hop in and uh, I'll try and keep an eye on them. Um, so what I'm talking about today, recommendations with TensorFlow, as, uh, as I was saying to Mick, and um, this was that uh, it was going to be uh, kind of TensorFlow recommender, recommender systems as a module or a, a library within TensorFlow and uh, I was kind of, this was kind of going to be a, an experience report of what it's like to use it. But in reality, it, it turns out to be kind of just very sensible helper functions to help you as someone who might be might making a recommender system to work in TensorFlow. So I thought what might be a more interesting kind of examination is to put that in context of what recommender systems are, how they might operate, and how you might think about them. Uh, when you go to do something in TensorFlow. So hopefully this will be kind of a, a high level view of uh, the details of recommender systems. Some of the details of TensorFlow, I, I looking at the polls, I, I, um, I, I noticed that the, the, uh, the deep learning frameworks might not be the, the thing people are most often using, which obviously they're, they're not uh, the most popular thing in the world, but they can be very useful. So hopefully this will break it down in a, a straightforward enough manner and if it isn't straightforward let me know or let me know i'll try and explain and the overview of what i'm going to be talking about is this kind of problem definition of what is like recommendation systems what they are specifically and um, and then i'm going to touch a little bit on um, tensorflow the basic bits and pieces of tensorflow uh, as a deep learning library and then get into tensorflow recommender systems and, and framing recommendation as a deep learning problem. And taking uh, as, a, as an example, one of the, the basic examples of re a recommender system in uh, TensorFlow to kind of spin out and look at uh, 
they listed here, collaborative filtering, content-based recommendation, and hybrids, hybrids and examples. And I'm gonna finish off the talk. Uh, I didn't really int introduce myself, I guess, uh, as, as Mick says, I'm, I, I work as a senior data scientist. Uh, recommendation has been a thing that I've, I've worked on uh, in a number of different uh, roles and also my academic background is specifically in recommendation, uh, which means uh, I might use I might uh, breeze through something that is complicated. So if, if again, if you have any questions, please please ask. So to talk about recommendation, it's a don't very... worry, Owen. I'm not shy about asking questions, so uh, I, I'll, I'm more than happy to jump in. But like I said, Great. for the rest of you, if if there's something you don't fully understand and I haven't asked about it, just pop it in the chat or pop it in the ask a question, and uh, I'm I'm going to keep an eye on that for Owen so that he's not distracted because um you know he can focus on his slides so i'll i'll kind of take care of all that admin cool actually uh, yeah. just one quick question before we start at the high level i mean everyone was kind of talking about recommender systems you know f i mean certainly five years ago when the meetups first started but even yeah, before yeah. that with like the the netflix prize and all that um yeah. they still popular i mean they were kind of all the rage but so, you know as every, as everyone will tell you this industry is incredibly fashion driven oh, and exactly. fab driven. Yeah, so yeah. are they still so, popular? I mean, are they still in use? They are, are they're so. absolutely still, still in use. Like when you look at something like Netflix, I think something like 75% of the activity uh, on Netflix is driven by recommendations that they give you. Um, okay. So it, it, it's very, uh, very widespread and very popular, but in uh, it can be often like there are no libraries that do it very easily if you want to do it very easily. Um, gotcha. And I, I think the thing that I'm kind of, I'm going to leverage a little bit here is to kind of say, well, there are many different types of recommendation. Um, right. And obviously like Facebook's newsfeed that's customized and things like that. Um, so th they are kind of everywhere. Um, right. And um, it, it is, uh, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll kind of talk a little bit through that, I think. So is it a case that like in most use cases, it's essentially a solved problem. So it's not, it's kind of boring now. It's, it's not as, as sexy as it used to be sure. in, in that kind of fashion driven sense. Um, and yeah. I think, I, I think, yeah. And, but I think there's a huge amount of impact you can have because it is, um, and I'm not going to beat around the bush. It's, it's a lot more fuzzy than like a statistics problem where there's a, a clear right, maybe a clear right and wrong answer. This, sure. uh, uh, as I'll talk about, there are, um, it's, it's coming from like library science, you know? Uh, so there's yeah. a lot of, uh, uh, fuzziness around the human need for a, a piece of information. Um, and, and to get to the slide here, like, uh, the, uh, the problem generally is like, there's a catalog of items. There's probably something good in there that will suit the person who's coming to it. Uh, can we can we find that for them? Sure. And that, well, and, just and, to, just to say about the stats problems, people like to think there's usually the right answer to a statistics problem, but in my experience, mm -hmm. that's not the case. I, <laughs> the, this got, amount um, of uncertainty is is <laughs> you know pretty common. I, I, I actually I was listening to a, a podcast with a discussion between two data scientists, one who works on search, which is, search is like the, the clear, the much clearer, easier problem compared to recommendation. Because sure. with, with search, there's an answer, you know, I'm looking for something, maybe yeah. it's there, maybe it's not. And, and that's, that's the unfuzzy version. But then um, another one of them works at Stripe, detecting fraud. And fraud, with fraud, you will have uh, either the payment is challenged in some time in the future or it isn't. So you can, yeah. it's almost the gold standard when it comes to ground truth because there's money on the line. Yep. Um, and he kind of said he got to spend all his time just working on models, not thinking about anything else. And uh, the, the, the guy who worked on search was, was saying that the, the problem really was that, I think he was actually working on uh, serving ads in searches. And the problem really was that there's a huge amount of human experience that goes into that. So that, um, he, yep. I think he was working at Google, but, but wherever he was working, the search team had a team off to the side that did uh, customer experience testing on the ads they were serving. So even with ads, they were ch testing for like the human experience element, of it, you know? Sure. So there's yep. a lot of fuzziness and a lot of um, yep. that kind of uh, uh, I, I do remember a talk that uh, uh, Pedro gave us, um, 
don't know if you remember Pedro, the actuary guy, yeah. but he was yeah. talking about recommendation and in insurance. And he actually used mm -hmm. Netflix as an example because he was saying like one of the difficulties with recommendation is he used an example from his Netflix account whereby he was recommended a film. I can't remember which one. It was like a science fiction one. He says, mm -hmm. I keep people keep recommending me this and I don't like it. He says, <laughs> and I totally yeah. understand why yeah. they recommend it because I mm -hmm. it ticks all the boxes for films I like. And yeah. for some reason, yeah. I don't like it. And this is why recommendation is hard because I totally understand why people keep recommending it to me, but I just don't yeah. like it. <laughs> yes, and, and uh, that's one of the things. So we'll, we'll move through this. I think after my problem definition, I start going into yeah. a little bit more. Sorry, I'll show up now. Uh, well, so, yeah, I mean, this next next slide is uh, kind of there to show that, like, with machine learning, you have problems that are classification and regression, and, like, if you're building a, a machine learning model to detect pictures of cats, there's either a cat in it or there isn't. Uh, with, where it comes uh, information retrieval, which is the, the uh, branch of computer science that uh, recommendations recommendation comes from, uh, you're talking about information seeking and kind of uh, the line between uh, the right answer and the wrong one is very, very blurry. So that there's a human computer interaction like design element to it. And this is the, the, the human experience element that I think is neglected in a lot of places like um, you would say that um, like YouTube's or, or Facebook, they get a lot of talk now for, for their algorithm that is uh, kind of showing people a lot of like uh, radicalizing content that people end up, uh, how would you say, just viewing hours and hours and hours of like, they start off watching like Jordan Peterson and they end up watching like some, some crazy conspiracy. Um, and the reason for that is that their recommendations are, are kind of optimizing for a certain uh, variable like view time. That doesn't account for the fact that like when humans get anxious, they want more information. So they keep watching, you know? Um, and I think that's where the human computer interaction aspect of this that's so interesting to me personally anyway, kind of comes in. Yeah, and there's that great yeah. phrase that, what is it like angry people click more or something like yes. that? There's that yeah. which is why it, becomes like outrage culture and all that because you're yeah. you're almost you're almost rewarded for getting extreme yeah. reactions from people exactly exactly um and so uh, here is kind of i put together the list of things looking back through research that 2004 when they were like looking at how people use recommendation or a recommender system and the top one, like the very top one, is to kind of say, I like this, save it. Or I like this, just note it so that I can go, go back to my list of liked things and, and see it. Which is kind of interesting when now we think of recommendation as the thing that uh, YouTube uses to keep you looking at new videos. Uh, or, or that uh, Netflix uses to keep you watching new shows. It's not about saving the things you like or, or uh, expressing your interest. Like, that, that's another one there like it's not about any of the social elements of saying i like this or here are things that i want to keep and, and remember it's more about the finding good items as it were and possibly even recommending in sequence I mean, depending on how they use it there there are some other kind of interesting jobs that recommenders can do as well that that aren't as optimized for generally in the wild so things like the just browse it browsing is i think is one of the more important ones where I don't know if you've ever looked at someone else's Netflix and you discover Netflix has about 20 different shows you've never even heard of. <laughs> um, that is, uh, basically they're not optimizing for just browsing. Like they're, they don't want you to have a full idea of the collection. They just want to see that you there's lots of stuff suitable for you. Um, and that kind of sometimes like fails because obviously you haven't expressed all your interests to them. Um, which is another thing that, that recommenders can... Yeah, or sometimes you just want something completely different that you haven't watched in a while. Yeah, exactly. But exactly. none of those things get... Like, YouTube is really annoying for that. Like, uh -huh. I keep getting various comedians, board game stuff, and NFL and soccer clips. And that's all exactly. the YouTube shows me now. It's very, mm -hmm. very annoying. It's weird when you go onto someone else's YouTube as well, or, like, a random well, yeah. YouTube, and it, you're just like, what the hell is this? a certain kind of expression yeah. of themselves. But it is like you're on a different website. It's a bit scary. Like when oh, yeah. it, you know, you do yeah. really understand how how people end up creating their own bubble and becoming in their own yeah. reality. You really right, do. Exactly. It's quite jarring when that happens. 
and and uh, even like back in 2004 they were talking about finding credible recommenders as a way of like understanding that this will offer me good suggestions and for me good suggestions are ones that don't seem to be putting me in a bubble or other people might not have that compulsion they just want to see the best the, the best thing um, so these are kind of the, the jobs that, that are kind of defined in the literature of, of recommendation. And there's a kind of a an art to it, really. And, and that is the thing that I think uh, is frequently you don't have in your head when you're, when you're thinking about recommendation. Uh, because it, we are kind of mapping this task that is like understanding humans onto a, like, in the case of like uh, deep learning, something that is a very specific type of computation that does get results and good results for, for the things that it works on, but has has left out that kind of human element or is making assumptions about it that we haven't fully uh, accepted, I suppose you'd say. So that's where I say this recommendation has an art to it that, that we approximate when we use machine learning to do it. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I've, I've had to develop a tactic with my wife whereby there's like I will literally just start a film because I know if I recommend it to her she'll say no because it doesn't <laughs> sound like something she'd enjoy uh -huh. and you put it on for 10 minutes and then he was like do you still want to keep watching and invariably she goes uh -huh. yeah 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 this is great uh, yeah but it's it, it's a bit like that it's something that's like a, a great example is um um not drive that rush you know the one about John James Hunt and and uh Nika Lauda yeah, yeah. To me, I have no real interest in Formula One. It didn't sound, but a couple mm -hmm. of my friends had seen it and they were like, watch that. So I just put it on for Fran one night and yeah, it totally, because it's a great film, but it doesn't sound like a good film unless you're into that kind of thing. It, but and, almost and, anyone can enjoy the film because it's just uh -huh. really well done. I, I think that as well is kind of a format thing. Like it, it's very hard to, um, like it, it's very designed. Like you have to think about how you're putting these things together or, or that kind of thing. And I think this um, art of recommendation uh, process is something that, I mean, when we start thinking about deep learning, um, and I'm like looking at the, the, I think the poll here, I'll just check the latest results. It, deep learning is maybe uh, newer to, to some people here, so I'm, I'm not going to go too deep into it. But um, when we start looking at it, we have to start thinking in terms of how can we turn uh, this, this fuzzy understanding into a like a clear one, and and we start doing things like in recommendation, it, you would have like explicit feedback would be something like, uh, I was recommended something, uh, an item in a shop, and I bought it. I definitely liked it because I spent money on it. Um, uh, whereas I was, uh, the classic example of implicit feedback would be something like Spotify. I listen to a, to a song, and then I listen to it every day for the, for the last week. I probably liked the song. Um, and we kind of, uh, this is how we extract these signals. And this is how we can uh, turn something like recommendation into a, a system where we can, uh, I suppose, the, the task of a recommender, which is to uh, predict or estimate the, the future uh, scores that someone would give different items, like items they haven't seen yet. So you can offer the best, the ones they will presumably give the best score to, which is a regression problem. And so we come to uh, TensorFlow, which is uh, Google's end-to-end -end open source machine learning platform. It is uh, quite a generalized library for processing da data in specific forms, and the specific forms are like uh, matrices or vectors. So like a uh, uh, row, kind of Excel spreadsheet rows and, and, and columns kind of would be one way of thinking of that. Um, but obviously on a larger scale and possible to parallelize over many machines and, and very, uh, that, uh, how would you say, in that kind of format. Um, and the way it does it is through these neural networks, or it's, it can be used, it's graph, sorry, it's graph processing can be used to create these neural networks. And uh, as you see on the graph, the, the neural network is a combination of input a number of hidden layers and uh, output. And uh, how, I suppose this is quite, is this new? Is this, uh, does everyone understand this? Should I go, how in depth should I go with this? Um, I suppose for, for my purposes anyway, um, that the uh, TensorFlow gives you the ability to train uh, models that are um, 
that can uh, be used to. Yes, as Nick says, he's keeping an eye on the chat. Uh, can be used to make predictions around uh, scores, and um, it does so in a, a kind of a novel way compared to, to previous uh, machine learning algorithms. If, if you're interested in me talking about that, uh, but really, it, oh, okay. Um, well, so what it does is, um, a pro, as it says here, learning to minimize some loss function. So essentially, what you'll do is say, uh, put in an input, and the input will be in the form of a vector, and uh, saying this is maybe a song, say. And what we want is, will Owen like this song? A yes or a no, please. And uh, it will go through its uh, hidden layers, so it'll go into the input uh, in, through its hidden layers, and produce a, either a yes or a no prediction. And um, then we will train it by saying, actually, when you said yes, you, you should have said no. And it, what it does then is essentially the, the intuition here is that it, it takes that no and says, oh well, if it was to be no, then this particular node on the on the hidden layer shouldn't have fired, which means these three nodes before it shouldn't have fired, uh, which, which is a process called back propagation. Essentially, it's going back th uh, backwards through the graph to say, here's what it would have looked like if this had fired proper, uh, 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 properly. Ah, yes. Um, there's also automatic differentiation, which I don't know too much about, unfortunately. Um, but the, the end result is that you have a neural net that has been trained to make some predictions. Um, I'm actually not going to go into it too much. The, the uh, TensorFlow recommenders is, uh, recommender systems is the library that kind of came out recently enough and uh, started uh, around February. And uh, there's Francois Cholet who wrote the book on, on uh, TensorFlow, deep, deep learning with TensorFlow, uh, kind of recommending it. And as I say, I was expecting it to, to be kind of um, maybe more in depth than it was that I could write uh, 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 or I could, I could present more fully on it. Uh, it is very much kind of, um, how would you say, a lot of helper functions, a lot of things that make your life a lot easier when it comes to uh, defining models that will do uh, uh, define things. Um, to find things uh, uh, that would cost you like hundreds of, line of lines of code for boilerplate code. So it, it is quite good, but I haven't found a lot to say about it. Um, so this is kind of TensorFlow is, a, is a, a very powerful tool for a very specific type of... Uh, so deep, deep learning obviously is uh, a very specific and powerful type of, of machine learning. Now, before um, uh, before deep learning was was popular, uh, recommender systems were in widespread use. Like uh, the Netflix prize was before deep learning. Uh, Amazon's uh, collaborative filtering recommenders were before deep learning. And um, so there, this is the thing that has been around for a a, a, a long time before uh, uh, deep learning was around. And deep learning uh, allows it to change in, in interesting ways. Um, so I'm going to talk through a very specific, um, so I'm, I'm going to take uh, uh, TensorFlow Recommender Systems offers this uh, kind of hello world example and I'm going to take, take it and have a look at it very briefly, very broadly. Um, so it, it makes use of the data set that anyone who's writing a, a Hello World recommender uses, which is called Movie Lens. Movie Lens is uh, it's a data set that was made by uh, Group Lens, who are a recommender systems uh, research center out of uh, Minnesota, I think it is. And they they put together this, this I think, varying different sizes data set of uh, combinations of movie information and, and user ratings of those movies. So, um, it's very simple. It's like CSV files of varying sizes for the number of records. And it just gives you an ID for the user, an ID for the movie, a rating, and a timestamp as the main source. And then there's some extra information you can get about the movie in the form of 
the title and the genres of the movie. It's interesting they give you a timestamp too. They so yeah, like yeah. watch they've ratings change over like time and stuff. Oh right, okay. I'll have they've to check been that going out, for a long while. Thing. Yeah. Um I don't know if that if the data goes back that far, but like they are um they have been at the kind of cutting edge of a lot of recommender work. Um and it, yeah, you can look at how uh, ratings change over time, um, and it, it allows you to have a lot of like different experimentation. There's been workshops around like degrading ratings and things like that. And um, as I as I mentioned when talking about uh, uh, TensorFlow, the input to TensorFlow is, is essentially always uh, vectors of, of some kind. Um, and so just to mention the kind of uh, embeddings or feature vectors. Now, if, uh, you kind of have to take whatever input you're going to uh, put into the system and uh, change it to the, to input to the input shape of the net that you're going to feed it to. And this means changing it into a, in, in the language, changing it into an embedding. And that can be something as simple as like a one-hot encoding to, to say, um, Essentially, here's a, a vector that's the length of the number of unique items we have, and we'll just set the one. Everything is zero, and we'll set one for whichever one that we are interested in, in this item. Uh, this is word to vec yes. Uh, so word to vec is a, a specific type of embedding that captures uh, uh, the content, essentially the context of a word. So it turns uh, uh, that. Uh, plain text English word into a vector of numbers that represents, you can kind of think about it as representing the word in a uh, n-dimensional space, I think it's 300 uh, long vector dimensional space. Uh, so you can do things like plot with embeddings, you can plot the similarity between items. So you can say uh, with word to vec, you can say king and queen are very similar. And you can also do kind of weird uh, mathematical operations on it uh, in, the, in the kind of form that uh, is it the SATs in America have those, those kind of questions like king is to queen as or puppy is to dog as, as yeah. uh, blank is to cat you can you can do those kind of mathematical operations with vectors to produce kitten and um, so yeah I think the one it's, it's kind of like king king minus masculine plus feminine equals queen roughly yeah yeah kind of thing it's that kind of stuff and it's it's by no means uh, perfect because it is learned yeah from you can't not mention this like it's it's learned from a context so it's sure usually learned from like a corpus of news articles or things like that so it's, it's not surprising to find that it is like massively like some of these trained models have been found to be massively sexist or there was one that was outrageous in GPT-3. I mean, it was black comedy, but it was basically someone that he was on Twitter. He tried to basically type like a Muslim does something and every single one of them ended up talking about terrorism. Like yeah. no matter what he tried, he tried and it was on YouTube of like 20 attempts uh -huh. and then he just gave up. It's, even even uh, he tried very specifically to prevent vi like whatever way he would put it in this really peaceful context without yeah, reading it yeah. and it would immediately turn violent. I, and that I, was obviously yeah. just where it's been trained from, you know. And, and this is this is the thing. Like uh, news coverage is obviously not. Uh, like, I mean, read manufacturing consent. News coverage has its own, but uh, <laughs> um, and even like Wikipedia obviously would only talk about things in certain contexts. And uh, anything that you look at will have its own context, and, and it has to be dealt with very carefully. And um, so, when we're looking at the, this, is kind of. We're, we're essentially translating whatever our input is into some form that we can we can feed into our model. And with the hello world, this this hello world approach, uh, which is the, the very basic uh, example of a recommender from TensorFlow, uh, they actually have a two-stage approach, which is, is kind of interesting because frequently what you would see is just uh, generate recommendations over the entire prediction set, over the entire data set for all users. Uh, but this actually, what it does is it does a two-pass prediction, essentially. So the first stage is uh, retrieval, and uh, retrieval is, uh, I've, I've uh, taken a, a picture of the code, but it's, it's very, uh, yeah, 
uh, you should know know a word by the company it keeps is exactly how words of that works. Um, very well. Well, for, for for the record, I'm outrageously stealing that uh, <laughs> sentence because it's great. <laughs> People are going to start hearing me. Yeah. Oh, Mick, Mick says some really profound shit. It's like yeah, <laughs> that's going to be one of them. Oh yeah. So the retrieval stage in this model, what it does is it uh, creates a f um, like um, this is high level, but it uses creates a user feature vector and a movie feature vector to look at. It is essentially winnowing down the amount of things it has to look at ranking. Because the worst thing that you have to do is like, well, Owen likes three movies, uh, find them in this data set of a billion items. So what it's doing is kind of taking a first shot. And the first shot it's doing is, is uh, looking at uh, a combination of the user embedding and the movie embedding to try and figure out a, a rank for the users the, that the user would give for a movie so it's it's doing something that's similar you could do that over the entire data set and uh, it could be a, a valid recommendation but there it's just doing the fast way to get to cool down the set and when it has cooled down the set then um oh, yes ranking so when it's cooled down the set what it does is it creates a, a different embedding for the user and a different embedding for the movie. And the different embedding uh, here is essentially that uh, one-hot encoding. And uh, for the movie, it's also a one-hot encoding that uses the movie's title, which is not exactly metadata, but close to it, um, because it doesn't use the title. But uh, it then builds a model that is uh, uh, fairly straightforward for the uh, Deep neural net and uh, uh, uses it to predict, to predict. and it trains uh, on the, what's the mean square error or the root mean square error to kind of minimize the, the difference between the training data and, and itself so it can make predictions. And so ju just to be clear, when it does the embedding on, I mean, I, I think I understand this, but just so mm -hmm. an embedding is essentially like a non, a, like a dimensionality reduction. So you're turning this, am I right in that you're turning this essentially large vector into a much yeah. smaller one well in, in the case of like the movie title it's transforming a a, a word into here's a vector that we can, we can feed in. sure yeah so right. in, in that respect it's uh, and it, it is a dimensionality reduction technique as well but it is fundamentally like about getting it into a form that can use i think right i suppose both are really great to go and say um so these kind of hints uh, the, uh, so these kind of hint at two different approaches to uh, to a recommendation. And the first one is collaborative filtering. And uh, collaborative filtering is uh, essentially we can use what we know about other what others like to predict or, well, we can use what we know about what others like to predict what a user will like the, what they haven't seen. So if myself and yourself like, the same set of things and you like three other things, I might like those three other things. It's kind of the high level thing. And it's it's good because it's content agnostic. And it's it's uh, the approach that Amazon used because Amazon, like they call themselves the everything store. Uh, it's very hard to kind of say, well, these books and these groceries, they're fundamentally different things. If we were to use metadata, we might get wires crossed and Amazon is known for kind of awkward and annoying recommendations but uh, in their at least in their original iterations they were able to do the, to recommend across their entire product line because they were content content agnostic yeah the one thing that Amazon still does which still obviously it must be a very hard problem to solve they still recommend stuff after you've bought it so you know like I'll buy yeah, some I'm... USB cables for my phone and I'm, uh -huh. I'll I know I get it in a year's time I might need more but there's no like cool down it's like the next day I'm getting recommendations for cables to be, to be honest I think that's probably more kind of a business uh, they have more valuable work they think they could do maybe oh uh, well yeah I yeah I, I do not think it would be hard for them to solve that and, and make their recommenders better but that's just me <laughs> um, but you can look at this as this looking at this activity around the items. You can think of it as kind of representing the items in probably similar to word to vec ways, uh, 
representing the items as a, a, a piece of information that, that uh, is, you know, you can represent them as the interactions that users have had with them. And then you can look at the similarity between those representations to try and get new recommendations. And obviously uh, noted here, suffers from cold start. If, there, if the item hasn't had any interactions with it, how, how is it going to get recommended to anybody? And I will hopefully get to an example that kind of solves that in an interesting way a little bit later. And that's the retrieval step from uh, from previous. <clears throat> so what this is usually done, or one way this is done is matrix factorization. And the, the intuition behind matrix factorization is in these factorizations, these the representations. So uh, a user's rating of an item represents the interaction between something about them personally that isn't kind of like represented in metadata directly and, and something about the item that isn't represented directly. And if we could know or estimate these things, we would be able to uh, know what, the, what rating they would give the item. And to, to make it a little bit more concrete, if we were to think of user factors as kind of these, maybe not, uh, it, it will be a vector of numbers, but, but if it was translated into human English, like, I don't like 1980s horror, but I love Hugh Jackman films, is something that's very nuanced and, and maybe not even represented in the metadata. Like, they maybe, like, in the, in the movie lens example, we don't have that Hugh Jackman is in the film, we might have only that it was a Western. Or something. But we can capture that people who have this attribute of loving Hugh Jackman films seem to like it. Um, and it's not a, a it, as I say, it's a vector of numbers. So it's, it's kind of opaque to us, but it comes through because it's, as we call it, a, it's a latent factor. And what, what you can do is if you have the users, the user factors, and the item factors. You can uh, do a dot product on them, and it will give you a predictive rating for that item. So you've, you've, uh, you can kind of look at it and say, okay, here's what we think will happen. Burn. So am I right in thinking of, let's say we create, essentially they're latent, I think like you said, yeah, sorry, late, I can't quite see factors. behind that. But essentially if you've got like, if you've got like 30 of them, let's mm -hmm. say, you create like a 30 dimensional vector for the yeah. user and a 30 dimensional vector mm -hmm for the item and the idea is that it's kind of like my preference times the amount of that preference in the movie yeah, yeah. and I multiply them together and add them all up and that gives me right exactly. okay yeah, yeah that makes sense and uh, um, I think I, I illustrate this a little bit more directly um, so in practice we will have portions of this we have samples we don't have uh, uh, how user one likes item one or not uh, and and so it's very sparse. It can be a very sparse thing, and the the factors can be used to reconstruct the ratings, uh, as I said. And you can then generate all the scores that are out of place and, and pick and, and recommend that way. Now, uh, to do this in the kind of as I say, recommendation existed before deep learning. To do this in the days before deep learning, you'd be using something like uh, Spark, I've done it in Spark, which has a, uh, a ML lib library that does alternating least squares. And the job of alternating least squares is to essentially estimate the item factor matrix using the user user factor matrix and, and, and switch back and forth between them until they converge. Uh, as in, things stay stable and don't change. Uh, so it, it's kind of like EM, is it? It's kind of similar kind of concept to the EM algorithm. You kind of yeah. try one thing and then do change the other, and then switch, and you just keep doing uh, it. Sounds it? similar. I don't know enough about EM to. to okay. Know. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's um, and it, it was well used and and uh, uh, worked pretty well, but is kind of computationally expensive. Like it, it's. That the uh, library that did it was on Spark, so it could be parallelized, so it could be done fast because it's a big job, and this sort of thing. And actually, TensorFlow 1, we're on TensorFlow 2 now, and TensorFlow 2 is more machine learning focused. And uh, TensorFlow 1 was more, this is a general graph processing library, from what I can tell. 
Um, and TensorFlow 1 did the non-deep learning approach to this. And it was good um, and it worked well, uh, but now there is essentially a neural version of that. So um, in this, this is 2017, uh, neural, neural collaborative filtering is uh, kind of suggested and uh, there's this paper here uh, that, that has the details of it. And the way it works is essentially replacing that dot product operation with a, a multi-layer uh, uh, neural network. And it, this allows it to, um, how would you say? Oh, before talking about what it does, it is TensorFlow's official kind of recommendation model is the neural collaborative filtering model. Um, and what it kind of, it takes as input sparse vectors like uh, one hot encoded user user vector and one hot encoded item vectors uh, in order to learn uh, the collaborative filtering model and doing this the dot product uh, isn't as it's doing this seems to capture more of the latent connections than the dot product and um, I'm, I'm not too sure why uh, on, the, on the theory of it, but it is, and uh, I've been working through the paper, it's quite interesting. And they are able to say that the neural collaborative filtering it is generic and can express and, gener and generalize matrix factorization under its framework. It actually, that, uh, that graph is their simple replacement, their drop-in replacement for generalized uh, matrix factorization. But their other contribution is this, Basically, what they say is our drop-in replacement beats the regular already, and now we're going to, using a deep learning network, we're going to tack on some bits. But essentially, we're going to increase increase the information it has, so that it can make a better prediction again, and it, that further pushed it into kind of the, the, the state of the art. And uh, so, from that perspective, uh, tools that you have with uh, TensorFlow allow you to kind of push into uh, improve the quality of these these recommendations yeah. and that is just from the the items modeled by user interactions no no content at all so what you the next kind of stage or the next kind of thing that you would look at is what if we don't really know anything like what if we've just set up shop or something like this and we don't really know anything about who likes what items or there's a new item in the catalog and we don't want it to be swamped there's a lot of like problems in, in recommendation about like if something is just swamped with activity then there's loads of loads of data about that but maybe much less about something else and there's an imbalance there and um, so you want to kind of combat that with uh, the content around the item like in, in the case of films we know the genre and uh we, we want to kind of look at ways that we can, um, how would you say, leverage that to get a, a better prediction. And factorization machines is one of the, the advances that kind of came out to, to uh, do that. And the way it does it is, so uh, it essentially does latent factors for uh, content explicitly. It is, uh, it introduces higher order interactions in terms of latent vectors. So it's, it's looking at creating vectors that represent some uh, interactions between attributes of the, say, the films uh, that wouldn't be captured uh, otherwise, that wouldn't be captured explicitly in the metadata, but do, are captured in, in the latent vectors. Uh, so it can uh, order, uh, it can, sorry, I'm trying to read this here. This means that the models go beyond co-occurrences in order to find stronger relationships between the latent rep representations in the future. So they're, they're, it's, it's quite powerful. And um, so it's implementation. There's a, a paper by Stefan Rendell, who is out of Google. And, and I don't I can't remember exactly how old this is. It's fair, like it's, it's new enough. Um, but it essentially is, is looking at um, it, it calls out in its abstract that uh, they're able to estimate interactions in every problem, even problems with huge sparsity like recommender systems, which are often like, very difficult for uh, for things like SVMs, which uh, don't work well. Um, and I've 
I didn't want to delve too deeply into this element in terms of the, the implementation, but there are a couple of links here if people want to check out like a my Python notebook or uh, uh, TensorFlow and li or TensorFlow library to do factorization machines directly. If that makes sense. Um, and that is like content based. So it's it's not looking at the interactions that people are having with it, it's looking at what it represents. And you can get to a state to, to do that on like could you do factorization machines on movie lens or is that just is there just not enough data there because all you really have is the genre uh, you can uh, or or do you actually need like a rich do you need a richer f data set do you need more variables on the items uh, you can, so you to can, be able to do can, uh, factorization machines the vectors together as i understand it um so you can use like the titles and the and the genres and um so maybe this is one one thing that is worth going to the next. Uh, so you can essentially creatively mix and match. So uh, Facebook came out with, okay. uh, they published the model that they use for their own recommendations. And uh, this is something that is not written in TensorFlow because Facebook wants to use their own deep learning libraries for everything, obviously. And they won't use Google's at all. Uh, but there are implementations of DLRM in TensorFlow. Um, but they, what they are doing is essentially creating a, fa a, a, a factorization machine and a content, uh, con matrix factorization and uh, concatenate, concatenating the results together. Um, and they do some other smart stuff in terms of the continuous features being represented by multi-layer perceptron output, which is it's kind of a, a you know feature engineering thing that, that helps the, the results and, and you know, kind of is, is deep in the weeds there. But the point is that here they are doing what is done in the, the uh, TF4S uh, example of, uh, how would you say, the collaborative filtering first and then content-based. They're doing both together at the same time uh, in order to get their results uh, fast and also productionizable. Um, because obviously that they care about, like, awesome and refresh the feed get the new recommendations or, or whatever. Um, so this allows uh, them to produce their recommendations as they want them, as they as they like them, essentially. Um, and the, the paper there is, is really interesting and it's definitely worth checking out if you're interested in this stuff at all. Um, because it kind of goes through how they're doing each of the, the portions of the embedding matrix factorization, uh, factorization machines. And also some talk on the how they are parallelizing each part of this, which I found quite interesting. Um, and so that's one way that you might creatively mix and match to get a, a good result. Um, I think, uh, so do, how much time do we have? To, there's one more example that I want to go through. Take as long as you need on, honestly, okay. there's no real okay. set time. So, so um, this is kind of, uh, an example of a recommender system that I thought was really, really clever. That kind of um, leverages about suppose, one or two key insights from uh, how these things work in a way that might uh, hopefully show them up to be useful and kind of uh, artfully done. Uh, so Spotify recommend music frequently. And music has a ton of problems in terms of how it's done. Uh, uh, it, uh, or how it's recommended, uh, including like assuming implicit, uh, assuming playback means that you really like it, is one thing, but there's a lot of like finicky ones, like people will listen to a full album. And uh, examples escape me right now, but like there will, on albums, there's frequently like a, a talky track that lasts 30 seconds, that's just somebody talking. And that's like, Nobody should be recommended that. That's in. It should take place in the album, yeah, but like it shouldn't be a, a valid recommendation. So, Spotify kind of were looking for. They're using the the late the clicks as a collaborative filtering model. You know, we've got all the play data, and we're going to look at recommending songs that are similar based on play data and based on on kind of the interactions that people have with them. And uh, that, that's fine, 
and then they add something to their catalog. Uh, when they add something to, to their catalog, they know nothing about it. Nobody's played it. Uh, they have maybe metadata, but uh, they, they can't always... Um, first of all, that doesn't slot in with the way they're recommending things, because they're not using a content-based recommender. Uh, but they want to um, they want to be able to like actually recommend it. And so this kind of long uh, quote is from a from an article that that uh, an engineer at Spotify wrote in 2014, where they were talking about this uh, collaborative filtering models uh, work that they've done, and how they can project in, in the same way that Word to Vec has this similarity. They're able to say this song is similar to these other songs. They can also say this user is similar to this other user from this user song interaction data. Um, but, uh, and they use that to provide their recommendations. Um, but they recognized that those points were things they could be predicting themselves. There were certain attributes of the songs that made it so that they, they sat in the place that they sat on that, that graph. So as it says here, if we can predict the bit position of a song in this space from its audio, we can re recommend it to the right audience without having to rely on historical usage data. So I'll show the, the graph. So here's kind of the, the high level uh, result or high level approach. So if you see on the left hand side, there's kind of a, a map. This is a, a T-SNE uh, reduced, like this is their vector space. And you can see that uh, the, in the, the green, I think is kind of like rock music. And then blue is like electronic music, and you can see how kind of different genres map into different positions on this space. And uh, so, obviously, they they this map is representing something that you can pick out good recommendations for people. And so, what they did was they took an image of the waveform of the song as the input, and they they built a. a, a uh, neural net that, uh, so this might be a little bit uh, awkward to read, but it takes as its input this image of the of the, the waveform of the song, reduces it down into a, a size of something that, uh, a series of numbers that it can intake as a vector, and from that vector predicts the location on this map to say, here's where it sits, it is a such an, it's an electronic song or it's a, a rock song, all from uh, without any uh, user interaction data. And then obviously, as they recommend it, people will play it more or play it less, but it gets it over that cold start issue that allows it to be then recommended. And, and based on that, they have kind of engineered or designed uh, a way for it to, to exist and be recommended in a way that allows it to kind of find its audience, I suppose. Um, and they had great success with this. So uh, I thought it was a really nice kind of piece of, of uh, design to figure out uh, a way to get around a, a common problem with these models that is very elegant. Yeah, you're essentially using the content of the song. Because that, right? Yeah. Because they're taking, I presume they take like samples of the waveform to account for different. Yes, uh, it's song I, lengths I or whatever. They've they some way of we're always going to take like a yeah. thousand snapshots of the waveform or something. That's really yeah, that's right, really yeah. good. Yeah, it, it's it's very clever. I think it, it, it on the, the numbers there. I think it takes up to like five nine nine. I guess that's like frames or whatever. Yeah, but um, yeah, it's I, I thought it was a really elegant way because cold start is such an issue for uh, for these collaborative filtering models it's essentially like what would people think of this if they listen to it and uh, which just yeah um and that's kind of my my big headline and <laughs> um, so like when i'm talking about these things i, I really kind of the, the idea of this is to impress uh, how much of an art it can be and how much feedback we can give them. Not just feedback, but like direct control over how other people experience these recommendations by how they're designed. And um, so if you're looking at uh, recommenders or anything like that, um, hopefully this like this is talked through the 
kind of two big schools of, of uh, recommender systems and looked at. Um, it hasn't delved into specific details, but hopefully if you approach TensorFlow with knowledge of, of the kind of recommender you're thinking about, it should give you some, some a Lego and maybe kindle some interest. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the talk. Cool. Thank you. Well, I, I've, I mean, I have a, a couple of questions, but in the meantime, for those of you um, who have any questions, just pop them into the, the chat there. I see a couple of the uh, regulars are kind of lurking there. Um, I guess I have a very generic one that I wrote here, um, which is probably a bit higher level than this. And thanks for that, by the way. That was great. Actually, I mean, for the, you know, most people know I, I have no real interest in deep learning because I never really need it. Mm -hmm. um, but now I kind of want to play around with that movie lens thing. I, that sounds fascinating, to be honest with you. Um, it's, a, it's a great data yeah. set. I, the, the last time I checked it, they've actually started making a synthesized version as well. So as much data oh, as Oh, yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And I, I mean, I, I really should learn some of this stuff because I know it's at some point it's going to be very useful. Um, but I guess a, a much more kind of higher level question is, and I'd say this, I mean, just for people or people who are going to watch this later, um, it is such an important aspect of business now, which is kind of where a lot of this stuff is is driven from. If you know, if you know, you're working for a company, and we can, I mean, we can come. I'm I'm very conscious that I'm asking a very generic question and asking for specific answers here. But like, let's say you're working for a, a small company, and they've just created a data science function, and the reason why they've hired you is because they want a recommender to work. And so they want to start mm -hmm. building recommendations for whatever reason. And let's make the assumption that it isn't because the CEO read something in The Economist and then has decided they need to data science. Um, but they're actually, you know, genuinely okay. it's something they've now realized, you know, it's an existential threat to their business if they don't start doing this. Uh, how would you go about it? What would you do? And we, I mean, we can, I can get, so we, I mean, if, if I need to be a bit field. more specific, yeah, if you're, you're coming in brand new and you're selling yeah. widgets, online let's say and let's assume there is no library or whatever Beautiful. Beautiful. uh how um, how do you how do you, what would you do or if someone came up to you and went I, oh and i, I need some help <laughs> you you know well, you I know how to build these to, like <laughs> i think you kind of have to take a uh, i suppose a, it's, it's never an easy answer but like it's kind of take a holistic approach like where are you putting it why are you putting it there um like Something as simple as Amazon's, like Amazon's, like customers who bought things like this also bought, yeah, is a super simple, very easy to build, and should see good returns on on the the effort. So, if you can even just build something like that, and you know, I, I'd be thinking in terms of what uh, are they trying to drive, like back to the jobs. You know, what kind of jobs do are are there to be done by the recommender? Right. You know, if you're trying to if you're trying to push like get an extra item in the basket, then yeah, customers who bought this also bought. So that's if like association get... rules, basically, is it? And basket analysis kind of stuff. I mean, it can be. I mean, if if you want to build something like a collaborative filter, you can do something like that. Or even I've done it with uh, like as, we, as I mentioned, Spotify. There, they've built a really good library annoy for uh, item similarity. So if you can represent your item as a vector. It, it put it in uh, on a map with all the other vectors it'll get like top 10 most similar like that okay straight away. what's the name of that library sorry um, i, I missed the name of it it's it's called a noi it's a python yeah python i think it's been uh, ported to a bunch of languages is that a n n o y like as in annoying someone yeah right okay yeah annoy yeah yeah spot on the spotify github right mm -hmm. i've used it a couple of times quite successfully okay mm -hmm. yeah uh, so yeah, I mean, you'd start. So yeah, I think that'd be thinking. Okay, so I mean, in that example, I'm saying with the widgets, like I mean, the great thing. I mean, I guess yeah. I know a little bit about this because the workshops we're running at the moment is based on an online retail data set. So I've, I mean, I, that's kind of how yeah. I'm learning this stuff. But yeah, the, in the next one that we're going to mm -hmm. do next month, which I'll talk about once we wrap up, we're going to be looking at association rules. And it just occurred to me that association rules is a recommendation system, even though it's a a very very simple one. Yeah. But, yeah I'm you can you can get as as uh, simple or as complicated as you want and and if you know if the person who's hiring me is like you've got unlimited budget and i don't really know what i want 
something something simple like Amazon has a personalization service where you can feed them a CSV file and they'll feed you like uh, uh, call it, uh, um, it'll it, it'll return like here are some recommendations. Like, oh wow! These okay. These things. Yeah. Just like yeah. as an API yeah. kind of thing, is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh wow! Okay. And I think you can even you can even make a like a live API that you can query on demand. Right. Okay. Interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, th- I think that'd be kind of like. And then once you go from there, would you kind of? So uh, I mean, I think with any data science, I am like it's very easy to get lost in the like I can build a cool thing. Yeah. Um, and so I, I I tend to be hesitant around like I take baby steps with it and see yeah. what they want and how they want it um, before you turn their entire business into like a Netflix style like yeah. once you're finished you're going to be yeah. recommended the next thing and there's nothing you can do to stop it <laughs> yeah the, the, I mean the one thing this has reminded me is uh, two things talking about the Netflix prize one is it was a huge SVD calculation that's they spent all their yeah. engineering time doing an SVD decomposition mm-hmm. that was it and uh, and then yeah. they use that somehow to create the recommendations yeah. but the other one is just how important linear algebra is like you just if oh, you're yeah. going to learn yeah. machine learning you have to learn linear algebra you, you i mean you don't have to be a ninja at it the three blue one brown guy he'll teach you most of what you need to know <laughs> but he will yeah he's great <laughs> yeah it's i mean if for anyone who hasn't actually seen that the three blue one brown he's got like a 20 episode video series of introduction to linear algebra they're all about four or five mm-hmm. minutes long they're highly visual they're absolutely brilliant. Like they, I can't recommend them enough. And um, they're if for anyone who needs to learn anything about, they should be recommended reading on Leaving Cert and just watch these because mm-hmm. all the maths will make sense once you've seen these videos. The other, I'm conscious of the time, so I, I've I've got and there's we're not getting very many questions on the chat probably because I'm busy hugging I, all the time. I just I just see uh, one here from uh, Fiona. Oh, uh, majority. Yes, uh, that is relevant to. We were talking about uh, collaborative filtering over something like association rules yeah. or market basket analysis. Um, so the collaborative filtering, uh, I would say, first of all, it's it's based in the user interactions, so it can uh, highlight the. Uh, so I, I suppose two things I would be thinking is uh, collaborative filtering tends to now have a lot of uh, libraries that allow you to do it quite straightforward. As I say, Amazon have a have a thing you can send a CSV file and get collaborative filtering recommendations if that's what you want to do. Um, uh, it's been a while since I've looked at association rules. Am I right in saying that with association rules you're defining the rules? The well, it's no, it's an unsupervised technique. So what okay. it does is yeah. it basically there's a few different ones. This is one of the things I, I I've been learning this as I'm doing the workshop. Um, but essentially what it looks as it looks at the probability of an item being in a basket and then what it does is it looks at the conditional probability of the item being in the basket given that another item is in the basket and that's like the lift so you can have like and the idea is they're trying to find the co-occurrences of items in a single basket yeah yeah. and the idea is you what you do is you 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 give it a bunch of parameters to find these and it it has some kind of mm -hmm. The a priori algorithm it uses and it kind of it runs through all these different calc and it does it reasonably quickly okay. and then it just lists the one yeah. that have the highest lift so you know what item mm-hmm. tends to you know there's some items that if you're buying this you're always buying something else so that will have a massive yeah, lift yeah. on that other that kind of thing so so uh collaborative filtering doesn't deal in any way with co-occurrence and um, so in, in that way if you don't care about co-occurrence you're not doing extra work that you don't need to do um, it's just here's the item that we think you will like best and um, it's a little bit more so it is a kind of a, a choosing the right tool for the job and um, in like in a lot of shops we, like i'm surprised amazon aren't looking at co-occurrence more um and, but the, the uh, collaborative filtering that you that amazon do for example that is that ends up on the people who bought things like this uh, people who bought that item bought things like this. It's not uh, a co-occurrence so much as it is a similarity between users. So there are other things that you could potentially do with it, like the the uh, in the deep learning example, it ends up 
you can look at similarities between songs based on how they're modeled from user interactions, um, which is maybe a step in a different direction from the association rules, but not a co-occurrence one. Okay. And, and if I, people I are interested in more on association rules, I will be talking about them more next month because we'll we'll finally get to that, to, uh, like three workshops in. We have another question there actually, which I hadn't noticed. I was yeah. singularly failing my, I had one job, which I failed to do, uh, which was notice people had asked questions. Um, so, oh, and for, also thank you. Thank you for the questions, Fiona. It's uh, it's good to see you on. Hopefully we can meet up at some point in the future when, um, you know, this bloody COVID thing ends. So um, a couple of questions from this, from Andre. Thank you. Uh, how do you deal with the weighting of inputs? Recent behavior might be more relevant than older ones. And how would you distinguish products which users did not click on VS products which were not shown? On, oh, sorry, versus products which sure. were not shown. Yeah. So um, weighting uh, depends on, I would say, there are a couple of ways you can, you can do weighting. Like, um, if it can be down to the architecture of the net that you design um, in order to make recommendations. Or it could be something as simple as saying that if you know the vector that you're putting in starts with the, the most recent value. As, as an example, you, you for a recommender, your input is the last three items that they, they looked at, and the, the output that you want is the next item they should buy, or, or, or something like this. Deep, deep learning right. architecture is very, uh, can be very fuzzy to talk about because you can do it in so many different ways. But, Let's say you do something like that. So the last three items they looked at. You could, for the vector of the last item, uh, downweight it or, or multiply it by like half, by 0 0.5 to, to half the, the vector. Uh, what's the term? Uh, half the size of all the value like of the it. vector to, to decrease it. Um, and, and that would be one way of weighting it. Um, other ways would be maybe more explicit um, architectural decisions that you make around the, the, neural, net, the neural network. And it, it can be done and has been done kind of sequence prediction ways. Or you could, I guess you could put in some kind of time decay as well. So the longer in yeah, time yeah. it has been, the, you kind of and, decay and by even, some kind even, of decay factor. And even that, that uh, the last three items they bought, uh, explicitly decays everything before that, like explicitly gets rid of everything yeah. before that. Um, and it takes into account as well that someone might not have been here for five years. So the last five, yeah, three things yeah. they bought may have been five years ago and it kind of, it allows for that, it, which is nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, and how you distinguish between what products, what which user, products which user did not click on versus projects that, products they weren't shown. Um, that would be in your kind of uh, uh, that Neil saying go all the way to the dynamic model. You definitely could do that. Uh, but then again, that would be like infinite resources, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That I was all I can think there problem. is, you know. Yeah, but also <laughs> you know Google esque levels of computation required. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, looking at the products that users didn't click on versus they, uh, 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 that they weren't shown, no. um, usually you are looking for this is with the this is I suppose an implicit feedback question, um, where usually with implicit feedback you're looking for positive examples. So I did click on this, otherwise don't mention, uh, because it's very hard to say when you when you get into that territory of uh, not, not clicked on versus not shown um, you're also getting into the, the territory of maybe I just didn't see that link when I was scrolling too fast how, how strongly do yep. you weight it against a person that they looked at something and didn't click on it? and I would, yep, I would say point. I haven't that. You, you don't really get a good result from from uh, penalizing them for, for having seen it I guess um, gotcha. if that makes sense it does yeah i hadn't thought about that that's a good one like just because i know i'm crap when it comes to scrolling i often i just you know I mean, don't see I mean, stuff even I, though it's right there in front of you you know I mean, yeah we, we all 
especially after yeah, humans are hard at the, the attention span. Yeah. Day, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one last question here, which is a great one, actually. So uh, we'll have one last one before we go. Is it thanks for the presentation? I suppose these systems might end up making recommendations within the bubble. Is there some work done to change the loss function architecture to make recommendations outside that bubble? And that's from Rakesh. So yeah, like, you know, so, bursting out of the echo chamber kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a perennial problem I, in a kind of a, I have a lot of mixed feelings on this, I think. Um, because you do see a, the problem that crops up time again is this bubble, but I think a lot of architectures are built with, when we go back to those jobs, like there are jobs there that like, I, I, I don't know about you, but like, I hadn't seen that list in a while and looking back over it, I was like, I haven't I completely forgotten about the idea of using recommenders to just browse, about the idea of using recommenders to understand the catalog fully, as opposed to just um, get the next good item yep. or all of the good items. And good items are, mm -hmm. are, are the bubble, essentially, you know? Yep. And yep. Good, but also good items are the thing that, that benefit like Netflix don't want to inform me about all of the, the shows they think I won't watch. Yeah. You know? um, yep. And and so that makes it kind of like because their business model is based on me watching and coming back. So there's a lot of um I think incentives around like what the purpose of these things are really um, that, that make it quite hard yeah. to but but um what I would say is um I kind of respect and I you do learn to value the places where you know Twitter or, or timelines where you can order by uh, the, by the actual chronological time you can do things to kind of get out of like these recommendations yeah. where they want you to see yeah I well I think the long-term business incentives that uh, Neil is saying in the chat and um, long-term business incentives are um, they, they can be very hard to see for any business, even businesses that are huge and, and have big budgets yep. for a lot of very, very uh, clever you, recommendations. You have a major agency issue. Like it's yeah. a big, like, um, obviously, I always talk about insurance, but, mm -hmm. like, insurance, everyone everyone pretty much, univer with the exception of a few people who are just mm -hmm. willfully blind, everyone has accepted that insurance is totally behind the curve when it comes to innovation and technology and, in many cases, isn't really fit for purpose. And yet mm. everyone, most people will tell you that like the problem is five years doesn't help me because I won't be in this job in five years. So if I'm, you know, and I, you yeah. know, there's no incentive for me to take a risk because mm. it's a five year problem and I'm going to be here for another two or three. And then I'm either I've going to moved on or I'll have retired or, you yeah. know, and that's, I mean, I don't know how you square that circle. That's a incentive design. They tried it with like long-term shareholder value, which, share you know making mm -hmm. management yeah. owners in the companies and we've all seen how that's worked out <laughs> so it's it's you know you you definitely have kind of almost like a pre and i guess there's ways around it by giving them long-term incentives with the company mm -hmm. so that you mm -hmm. you know your shares don't vest or you whatever but that causes more problems and also if your competition doesn't lock you up then you're forced to compete you know so you this have it. yeah yeah it's it's right. it's it's yeah. not an easy problem to solve not at all. I, I think um, for us regular Joes not getting shares in companies, uh, I think the best yeah. way to, to I, like, to, first of all, we have to be aware that it's an issue. And I think there's a lot of um, a lot of good writing on on how companies that are using recommender systems that keep recommending things that make up, like uh, coverage of YouTube's algorithm and how it has, like, recommended all sorts of horrific things and, and Facebook's algorithm that, that kind of continues surfacing groups that are, are hate groups, you know? I think um, yep. that as long as we stay aware that like what we're given is being designed uh, or he the way we're given things is being designed, uh, hopefully we can make some choices around that and maybe also expect that it would be designed in a way that doesn't funnel us down next good item, next good item, next good item. Um, yeah, dopamine hit, dopamine hit. Dop yeah. I mean, dopamine hit. 
<laughs> those are very much uh, open questions that aren't uh, I can't solve. Yeah. Uh, okay. So. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, on. Well, I'm, even if you can just sort out recommendations, that'd be great. Um, thanks for everyone. Uh, we'll 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 start to wrap it up there. Uh, it was great to see some regulars in the chat. Um, hopefully, I'll I'll probably reach out to some of you. Like I said, we're always looking for speakers. Um, I run some um, I run workshops in the months when we can't get a speaker, and getting speakers has been quite challenging in COVID because, as I always like to joke, and I joke about it, but it's also the truth. My standard method for getting talks off people is either going to meetups or mugging people at the bar after our existing meetups or as of tonight, emotionally <laughs> blackmailing regulars um, <laughs> that you know that I know and can basically d go with a convincing sub story of oh we really like to talk we have one in ages, but you know there's only so many times you can play that card. Um, so if anyone would like to give us a talk, um, and I know there's a couple of you in there that I have been hitting up, so you will probably hear from me in the next few days over giving us a talk at some point in the next few months. Um, by all means, uh, give us a shout. We'll be back next month with my workshop series, which is kind of happening in lieu of speakers. So I, uh, it's the retail online retail. Um, I might actually look at some recommendation stuff after this own because I, I was kind of, I, it's so far all we've really done is data exploration and modeling and plotting. We haven't really done any like statistical modeling or any kind of predictive stuff. It's all been kind of plots and data stuff and that will be continuing in the next one next month i think it's the middle uh, i have the date set in my zoom calendar it'll be it'll be on meetup in the next probably tomorrow um but we will be looking at association rules for that um because it, it's it's a nice and simple one to look at and yeah, yeah. we'll be i might actually see about maybe i might have a chat with you over the next couple of weeks about maybe doing some recommendation stuff that might be Ooh, an yeah, interesting yeah. thing to look at um it's an interesting data set uh, and, and mm -hmm. it does have some text so we could probably even do that on the item filtering. That might be interesting. Yeah. Um, I don't know how long the, the meetup series is going to last. It's basically for as long as I'm trying to do it from start to finish. So um, it's kind of going to take as long as it takes is kind of the way I'm talking about it. And part of me is thinking about shortening some sections. But then I thought, no, because it needs to be realistic. It's kind of the point. So that's yeah. why we're still on data exploration and, and understanding and stuff. But that's it. Um, keep an eye on meetup i would like to thank you very much on that was absolutely brilliant i really thank enjoyed you. that um you. you said you're happy to share the slides um uh, is that yeah, correct yeah. yeah um i'll i'll put a link up probably on meetup and on linkedin uh, probably mm -hmm. tomorrow with the link to it or the file or whatever um mm -hmm. and I'll, I, I'll contact you after this about getting that but also uh, a huge thanks to flavia for staying at our office desk at home late <laughs> Uh, under, under these COVID times and uh, yeah and thanks to all of you for coming and uh, hopefully we'll see you next month and uh, in the next few months back on Crowdcast and I'll pass you back to Flavia. Thank you Mick. Um, so I just want to say thank you all for joining and keep an eye on our newsletter if you want to keep up to date with our events so I'm just going to drop this here in the chat um, and that's all. Thank you guys. Thank you for coming. Yep. Thank you. Bye. See you all soon. Bye-bye.